Continuing the year of the wheel of time, I wanted to address a question that has been plaguing the fan community here. What is the most difficult aspect of the series to adapt? Obviously, there's a whole lot of ways to answer this, and there's several things that'll be extremely challenging to bring to the screen. When you're transitioning across mediums, you're gonna have to learn to recommunicate many things that may be extraordinarily tough to adjust. The most frequent one that is brought up is the one I disagree with the strongest, and that is how to portray channeling. We actually have from Robert Jordan in the graphic novel for A New Spring how he wanted it visualized, and I think it looks fine that way. So as long as they just keep it from depending on whose perspective you're watching, if someone could view the weaves or not, and then you just show the result of the weaves as well with high budget and long time in post-production CGI, or maybe practical effects depending on what's happening, I don't think you have that big of a problem there. I do not think channeling will be as tough as many people seem to think it will for the show to handle. It won't be easy, I'm not claiming that, but many people claim that it's the reason the show shouldn't be made, because this magic system can never be shown visually and I just, I disagree with that on face value. Another thing I see brought up quite often is the shadow spawn, and there's a bit more of an argument to be made here. I do think there are descriptions and certain features of shadow spawn that if I was working in a design department with uh, makeup, prosthetics, or touching it up with CGI and post, it would definitely be a heck of an undertaking to bring these to life realistically. Probably the easiest would be the Trollocs. You just need a lot of very well done makeup and maybe touch it up with CGI after the fact, and then you'll have them well presented. From there, the Merge Roll are a bit more difficult. You definitely have to add something in post to have their kind of out of reality presence there, maybe a coating of CG is actually appropriate for this creature because that helps kind of remove it from the reality it's in, but I'm not sure if you want to do something that blatant. I'm actually more of a fan of like audio cues, really making them feel otherworldly. That's just me. Drakkar, I think you can definitely wrap up with Trollocs, and the most difficult are going to be the Greymen and actually the Golom for me. Spoiler warning for this video, by the way, of like yellow, I'm going to mention things vague and some early series spoilers, but nothing really important down the road. Greymen are assassin type shadow spawn who your eyes slide over, you don't really see them, and I have no idea how I would represent that in a show, but maybe they just cut Greymen all together, maybe they do something again in post, or they hire the most bland looking actors they can, I'm not sure. That's one that's a bit out of my scope. And for the Golom, there's just going to be very difficult CG shots to make look not goofy. Showing a person sliding under a door could very much so look Looney Tunes-esque if not handled properly. But again, I don't think this is actually the toughest part of the books to bring to the show. The next thing I see mentioned quite a bit is the communication with the wolves, and once again, they're just gonna have to take some artistic leniency there, but I certainly don't think it'll be a make or break it instance with the show at all with the Wolf Brothers and their communication. Probably just end up with voices and heads and I'm frankly okay with that as long as they make it clear that we're seeing a translated version of what's happening through some dialogue. The dream world's often mentioned as well. This one, there's gonna be heavily reliant on subtle audio cues and some visual post overlay to clearly show that our characters are not in our world and they're in some kind of dream space. I'm fine with that as long as it's not too upfront and so bold that it's just distracting from whatever's happening on the screen. It could easily be overdone, but I don't think, again, it'll be as hard as some people say. And the final thing is actually somewhat lending to the point I want to make here and what I've chosen. A lot of people bring up just the sheer size of the series, and I think we're going to see a bit of a master and commander approach where certain elements from book two are in season one, maybe book three are in season one, and then they have to just kind of blend and condense, maybe film multiple seasons a year so the actors don't age up too much. I don't know. That's what I would do, but I don't know what their budget and scheduling's like. It's all still kind of up in the air for now. We have seen definite signs from Rafe that season two is already at least in somewhat production. I hope that's the case, but for now, what we really have left is just 
what from that condensing could really take a blow and come across poorly. And that brings me to what I actually think is one of the most difficult things they're going to have to tackle as writers. It's not as much visual, this is about how it'll be written into the script, and that is Matt's luck factor. One of the biggest complaints you see consistently online about very powerful characters is them coming across like Mary Sue's. And I've heard some people say that Rand's going to, but I, I find that to be insane. As long as they keep even half the time Rand fails in the text and clearly demonstrate his very slow and earned escalation of power which occurs and show that he is trained at one point by someone who understands the powers he's handling, that's not Mary Sudom at all. It's someone who gradually earns their escalating power and fails along the way. That's completely earned. But Matt's power could be, I think, much more poorly communicated a lot easier. Because if you do not put in the subtle context for why he gets this ridiculously strong luck factor above everybody else's, essentially woven in plot armor for being blunt, it could just feel like there's this character, if you haven't read the books, who they kind of were like, well, he needs a power too, so... He's really lucky when he wakes up in the White Tower and move on. And that could be detrimental. That's something where as the series goes on, if his luck factor becomes too forefront to the script, it could heavily detract from stakes continually every time he's in a scene because we know there's this character who's just going to be fine. And in the books, that's not a problem because of some very subtle choices from Jordan that greatly help Matt's character continually to feel like one of the most vulnerable in several ways. So I'm not advocating for them removing Matt's luck factor at all. No. In fact, I actually think they don't need to explain it too heavily, just give us enough an explanation for anyone who hasn't read the books to understand this is a result of some self etc., etc., and it'll be okay. But what they need to do is actually take a cue from Robert Jordan and make it so that Matt's luck factor is extremely fun, it's great with the action scenes, and we love action scenes with Matt. But a clear distinction there are the action scenes with Matt are not why we love Matt. We love Matt because of who he is as a character and a lot of the suffering he goes through, and they definitely need to keep that suffering in the pages. Matt is a character of sacrifice. I've said that before and I will say it again. We watch him give and give for those around him. He loves his friends and anyone he loves, he will put himself in harm's way to protect. And just because he has this luck factor which benefits him directly does not mean that he can be harmed or fail indirectly. And that is something that happens in the series repeatedly to Matt and is really important. Yes, his rescuing of Elaine and Nynaeve is a bunch of fun and it sets up really nice character stuff later on, but the subtlety of that moment and what it then lends to the series down the road in terms of demonstrating how far Matt is willing to go as a character to protect those around him that he loves, that's the important element to keep there and really show that you as the viewer should love this guy because while there's this perception that he's this selfish jerk, that's not accurate. And we see later in the series, more and more characters recognize that. We have quotes from main characters who are saying there is really no better friend than Matt. He is someone who will go to the end of the earth for you as long as he knows you're worth it. That is so crucial. And if we capture that element and show Matt still having bad things happen to him despite this ridiculous luck factor, then you don't have to worry about him coming across as someone who has all this power that's completely unearned because that's not the focal point anymore. Yeah, it's there, it's fun. I think they should keep that fun. Matt's fight scenes are a total blast and watching him just kind of bumble his way through uh, coming in command of some serious power is really great, but it's not why we love him and that needs to be really prevalent in this script they are writing. Don't translate Matt as just a, oh, look at him now with all of his power and focus on the fun that you have along the way. Well, it certainly should not be forgotten. That's not where the core of his character resides. It's a result of his character being in these situations. But for me, dialogue with Matt is a lot more subtle and important than a lot of people give it credit for. Not only because his dialogue has the responsibility of communicating a very foreign magic system that I think a lot of typical fantasy casual viewers will be used to, but it also needs to convey this character who has this expectation of selfishness on top of him, when in reality he's the most selfless character the series has to offer. Barney Harris may have one of the most difficult characters to act 
in the entire series on his shoulders. And on top of that, a lot of people write off Matt's character as the jokester and don't realize the nuances that really made them fall in love with him. Anyway, that's just my thoughts on why Matt's luck may be the most difficult thing to bring to the screen from the Wheel of Time in terms of story elements. But I'd love to know your thoughts on the matter as well. Do you agree with me or completely disagree? Do you think there's another element from the story that is going to be much tougher to communicate to audiences and make them really understand with without devaluing the series or forgetting any of the real core aspects of what makes this story work. Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to know your thoughts on the matter. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here and have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my three latest high tier Patreons. You guys are going insane. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the latest audio sample put up that my brother performed. Uh, but I want to thank Ron John Abraham. Thank you. Toby King, which awesome name. And Joe Polly, who I actually knew someone with your name growing up. I don't know if that's you. I don't think so, but maybe. And have a good one, y'all.